Hey freediving family! For those of you that usually watch my vlog, this is going to be a very different kind of video. In this video, I'm going to be presenting what could be some potentially new ideas or new approaches to equalization and exploring what I believe could be some misconceptions in our equalization knowledge. As a lot of you already know, I recently did a whole bunch of equalization experiments inside an MRI machine that was capable of taking MRI videos. So for the first time, we were able to see what was actually moving and how it was moving when we equalize. When I did the experiments, I, I honestly didn't think that I was going to discover anything. But after studying the videos, I realized that some of our equalization knowledge wasn't actually aligning to what I was seeing inside the MRI. So before I begin with this, I'd just like to put up a few disclaimers. The information I'm going to present was new for me, and it has been new for all the freedivers that I have thus far shown it to. So it's been new for all the freedivers in my circles. Now that doesn't mean that this knowledge or these techniques haven't been known or practiced by other freedivers for years and we just, or I just haven't known about it. I do have some pretty educated and skilled freedivers in my circles, but what I'm saying is that if I do call this information new, by no means can I speak for the entire freediving community. I'm aware that the information I'm presenting is based on the MRI videos of only one person, me. My technique may be imperfect. My, te my technique may be uh, unique to my anatomy. So I would like us to think of this information as preliminary findings. And in truth, the only reason I'm actually making a video about it now is because of the overwhelming success I'm having teaching these new techniques to my students. So far, I've taught these techniques to 60 students. And like I said, the results have been overwhelming. We've had students learning how to frenzel equalize very quickly and proficiently, students learning how to mouth fill equalize very fast and very proficiently, and students uh, going from being feet first divers to head first divers in very short periods of time. But 60 students is a rather small case study. And so I would like to open this up to the community so that you can try these techniques, so that you can try them with your students, with your friends, with your dive buddies, so that the community in general can test these techniques and perhaps develop them and take them further. Final disclaimer is that I typically teach freediving in eight day training camps, which means that I will naturally be inclined to develop freediving techniques that can be taught or that can be learned proficiently within that time frame. But it doesn't necessarily mean that these techniques are applicable to all situations. I will always be governed by the circumstances in which I personally teach. A huge thank you to Michael Board, Goran Kolac, Matt Molina, Alexei Molchanov, and Dean Schausch. The conversations that I've had with these divers, whether they knew it or not, <laughs> helped me form a lot of the ideas that I'm presenting today. And as always, a huge thank you to my patrons on Patreon. Patreon is where I'm creating an extensive video manual for freediving. It's $5 a month to get access, and the funds go towards helping me create videos like this, helping me carry out research like this. I do hope that all of my patrons feel a sense of ownership for this information because it was you that funded this research. Okay, let's begin. I would like to start by, by drawing your attention to this area here. This group of muscles, cartilage, and tendon is the larynx. It ranges from the epiglottis up here down to the subglottis right below our vocal cords or our vocal fold. The larynx plays probably the largest role in freediving equalization, but so far, its role has been underplayed. Let's have a look at the larynx's range of movement. We're able to lift it up quite high, and we're able to drop it down quite low. There's quite a large range of movement. For me, the really interesting thing with the larynx is, is that it has paired movements with a lot of the muscles around it. Have a look at this video. This is a video of me breathing in and out of my nose. Watch how the larynx has subtle movements up and down as I breathe. So when I'm activating my respiratory muscles and just breathing, my larynx is moving along with it and I haven't even been aware of it. The larynx having paired movements with the muscles around it is something that I want us to keep in mind going forward from here. The way I've structured this video is that we'll first look at what could be misconceptions and equalization knowledge, and then I'll go on to suggest an alternative technique. So with our attention placed on the larynx, 
let's have a look at Frenzel equalization. We're going to look at the Frenzel equalization itself and reverse packing. After studying the MRI videos, it seems to me that the tongue doesn't play the role in a Frenzel equalization that I originally expected, by which I mean the tongue doesn't really play a role in the creation of pressure itself for the equalization. This was a huge surprise to me because every single Frenzel presentation that I've ever heard or personally taught always did place emphasis on the use of and control of the tongue. This is a video of a T Frenzel. Pay attention to the movement of the larynx. This is a K Frenzel. Once again, pay attention to the movement of the larynx. And here is a H Frenzel. You can see quite easily how the driving force for an equalization is in fact the larynx and not the tongue. So why does it feel like it's the tongue that's moving? Well, I, I recently threw around a, a bunch of ideas with a speech pathologist and she confirmed that in the movement of an equalization or during a frenzel equalization, the tongue will tense up or contract, but it doesn't actually tense up or contract in a way that, that creates pressure for the equalization or that, that puts air or pushes air into the middle ear. The average person also has much more awareness of the tongue than they do the larynx. So it, it makes perfect sense that we would pay attention to or, or feel the tongue tensing up more so than we would feel the larynx lifting. After looking at all of this, it seems very clear to me that the role of the tongue in a frenzel equalization is simply to create a seal so that the air doesn't escape out of the mouth while the larynx lifts up to push the air into our nasal cavity and then into our middle ear. Just to demonstrate this further, this is a video of a P frenzel. A P frenzel is where I create the seal with my lips and I don't involve my tongue at all. My lips are the seal and then I simply lift my larynx. This has all made me completely rethink my approach to teaching frenzel. I believe larynx control is paramount. As long as my students can place their tongue in a comfortable position for the equalization, I think the time would be better spent focusing on developing control of the larynx. But I would love to know what, what all the other freediving instructors out there might think about this approach. For me, thus far, it's been incredibly successful. Now, I'm also not saying that developing mastery of the tongue and the different positions of the tongue, the P, the T, the K, the H, isn't important. But for me, I'm not seeing it as something that I would want to introduce in the beginning when I'm teaching Frenzel. And I'm viewing it more as a precursor to mouthfeel equalization. Because as long as the vocal fold is closed, the soft palate is open, the tongue or the lips are creating some kind of a seal, all one has to do is pinch their nostrils and lift their larynx and they have a Frenzel equalization. Let's look at reverse packing now. A reverse pack is how we refill our mouths with air from our lungs so that we can continue to frenzel equalize. It's an essential part of the standard frenzel technique. Here's a video of me doing medium sized reverse packs. Here's a video of me doing smaller reverse packs. These reverse packs are much more like the size that I would be doing on an actual dive itself. You can see here the mechanics of a reverse pack. The larynx drops down with the vocal fold closed and then the vocal fold opens and the larynx drops down a tiny bit more to create suction and to pull the air from our lungs into our mouths. Reverse packing does happen quite quickly and uh, this MRI was only capable of shooting five frames per second. So the video isn't as clear as I'd like it to be. It's a little bit jumbled. We can't see the specifics of the movement in most cases. The technique I'm going to suggest for Frenzel isn't all that different from the one that we're already working with, but the, the emphasis is very different. The focus is on the larynx, not the tongue. And it goes like this. We first develop control of the vocal fold or the glottis. We then develop awareness and control of the soft palate. We then learn how to control 
the larynx. We learn how to lift it, we learn how to lower it. We choose a natural position to hold our mouth in, be it a P, a T, a K or a H position. And then we pinch our nostrils and put it all together. Before we move on, let's actually look at how we would teach someone to develop an active control over their larynx. For the most part, we only use our larynx in conjunction with speaking, eating and breathing. So most of us don't begin with, a, with an active control over it. To do this, we need what are called cueing exercises. So uh, quickly, a big thank you to Dave Mullins, the Australian Dave Mullins, not the deep diving Dave Mullins from New Zealand. <laughs> thank you, Dave, for fleshing out my knowledge on cueing, on cueing exercises and the process of developing cueing exercises. A cueing exercise is basically when we tell someone to do something that they know how to do with their body <laughs> that gets them to indirectly move their body or their muscles in the way that we want for our purposes, or in this case, for our exercise. For example, to get someone to lift up their larynx, I'll often ask them to simply stick their tongue out as far as it will go. Now some people, when they stick their tongue out like this, they will lift their larynx up with it as well. Some people won't. It actually just depends on whether that individual has that specific movement paired between their larynx and their tongue. And so if they're not lifting their larynx when they just stick their tongue out, the next step is I get them to stick their tongue out as far as it will go, and then to heave as if they were vomiting. <laughs> For me, this has a 100% success rate in terms of getting students to lift their larynx. But I definitely think there has to be better cueing exercises out there. I think there has to be something a little bit more simple and elegant. And uh, if you do know of any, or if you are currently using some that are better, I would love to know. When I first began teaching freediving, and I was teaching someone how to do Frenzel for the first time, I would ask them to put their tongue in a T position, uh, to pinch their nostrils, and to make a T sound. And you know what? It worked some of the time, but most of the time it didn't. And looking back, I can see that it worked for the divers that had paired movements between their larynx and their tongue when they were making the sound T, and it would not work for all the rest. So I believe it's better to get to the core of the issue and just teach someone how to move their larynx up and down. <laughs> to teach someone how to lower their larynx is actually quite easy. You simply ask them to stick their tongue out as far as it will go, and then fold the tip of the tongue back over itself and you pull the tongue into the mouth. What will happen is the larynx will always drop down to make room in the mouth for the tongue in that position. So far with this exercise, I also have a 100% success rate with students. So just to reiterate, the steps to teaching somebody how to frenzel equalize are, number one, get them to be aware of their vocal fold or their glottis. And we do that with our standard <gasps> exercises. <laughs> Number two, get a person or get a diver to be aware of the movements of their soft palate. And I find the easiest way to do that is get them to alternate between inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the mouth or inhaling through the mouth and exhaling through the nose. Number three, develop control of the larynx. Use cueing exercises to get them to lift it and to lower it. And then as they do those exercises again and again, they will learn how to isolate just the movement of the larynx. Number four, choose a comfortable seal for the mouth, P, T, K, H. Number five, pinch the nose, put it all together. <laughs> Once a student has a basic ability to move their larynx up and down, I, I think it's a really good idea to give that student larynx control exercises. And just to give you an example of where my head is, and just to give you an idea of where my head is at with larynx control exercises, here's an example. I'll get my students to do five full larynx pumps with the tongue in a relaxed or neutral position, down, up, down, up, down, up. Then I'll get my students to do five full larynx pumps with the tongue in a T position. Then five full larynx pumps with the mouth in a P position. Then five full larynx pumps with the tongue stuck out. And then five full larynx pumps with the tongue folded over itself. And then, we repeat that sequence 
five times. So let's look at a method for getting a diver who is only able to feet first equalize to being able to head first equalize. To my knowledge, there are two main issues that stop a diver from being able to equalize head first. The first is an anatomical issue, by which I mean that that diver has short, tight or tricky eustachian tubes. But it's not actually this particular problem that I believe I've developed a new solution for. It's the second one, which is when the soft palate closes up against the back of the mouth or the throat and doesn't allow air to pass from the oral cavity into the nasal cavity for the equalization. The solution is actually very simple, but I do want to say before I jump into it, that in these cases, simply teaching a diver how to friends will equalize, in my experience, never solves the actual problem. So let's have a look at what happens to my soft palate when I simply drop my larynx down. As I lower my larynx, my soft palate opens or is pulled open. So far in my experimentation, this is universal. And when a feet first diver lowers their larynx, their soft palate opens as well. So what I'm now getting feet first equalizers to do is more or less a normal frenzel, but with an extra step. Before they lift their larynx to equalize, they drop their larynx down first. They drop their larynx down first to open up their soft palate, and then they lift the la their larynx up to equalize. I call it the drop frenzel because all of these things need little cool names. <laughs> it's a very simple thing. And so far for me, the success rate has been significantly higher than with any other approach or technique that I have tried or witnessed. But it does only work if that diver has a reasonable control of their larynx. Without that, they won't be able to coordinate the movement. And for me, this feels like just another reason why introducing larynx control in the very beginning is such a good idea. I've had the best results with this method by simply getting the feet first divers to dive feet first for the first day or two, working on their standard frenzel technique. Then on day three, I get them to invert and work on the drop frenzel. Now with the divers that I have trialed this approach with, by day four or five, they haven't even needed the drop frenzel. I assume they have just developed enough control and awareness in that time to equalize and keep their soft palate open. But, I mean, who knows? Maybe doing the drop frenzel is a, a really good way to indirectly teach control of the soft palate. It's such its early days. Okay, so let's look at mouthfill equalization. I'm going to start by showing you a video of me charging a mouthfill. I'm charging air into my nasal and oral cavity at the same time. I want to show you this video because I think it's interesting to see just how much air sits in the throat on top of the vocal fold. And so we can see what my mouth looks like at the start of a mouth fill. Now this is me doing a constant pressure mouth fill. A constant pressure mouth fill is simply when we apply pressure all the time for a constant equalization. Our ears are equalized all the time as we descend. Now since studying the MRI videos, I am starting to feel like the constant pressure mouthfeel isn't the best technique to be teaching to beginners. I personally believe that all mouthfeel techniques are equal. I believe that people develop their own styles and eccentricities with their mouthfeel. And I believe that all of these different techniques have the capacity to be taken to the same depth. But in this context, I'm really talking about a mouthfeel method which is really conducive to people learning mouthfeel for the first time. And so after watching the MRI videos and my experimentation, I don't believe that a constant pressure mouthfeel is a good way to begin teaching someone mouthfeel. I believe it's a mouthfeel technique that's better introduced down the line after someone already has developed some mouthfeel skills. Once I saw the MRI videos of just how much air is sitting on top of the vocal fold in the throat, I started to think about all the divers I know that are complaining about leaking mouthfills or that are complaining about swallowing their mouthfill. It seemed to me that 
Maintaining enough pressure for a constant equalization was excessive for the vocal fold or, or for the glottis or whatever we're referring to it as. If we are creating enough pressure to equalize, we are also creating pressure against the vocal fold. And so this has led me to the conclusion that the only divers that really benefit from a constant pressure mouth fill are divers with a very strong or a very natural no hands equalization. Divers capable of holding their eustachian tubes open the entire time so that they, they barely have to push at all to equalize their middle ear. The other thing about the constant pressure mouth fill that stood out to me while I was studying the MRI videos is the tongue roll. So in the explanations on constant pressure mouth fill that I have heard or taught myself, once the air has been compressed to the point where we can't create pressure with the cheeks, we simply put it behind the tongue, put the tongue in a T position, and then roll the tongue back to a K position, and then a H position. But this is a video of me doing a T frenzel. Note the position of my tongue. There's air above my tongue. This is a K frenzel. Note the position of my tongue. Almost the entire surface of my mouth is making contact with almost the entire surface of the roof of my mouth. I'm really not certain that the tongue has the, uh, the ability or the coordination to move from a T to a K to a H position in a smooth, seamless way in which constant pressure is created. To me, this makes a lot of sense because most of my students, when I'm teaching them mouth fill, have issues transitioning from the T to the K position. And when watching these videos, it seems like this transition is more inclined to having students or to having, having divers to just slam their tongue up against the entirety of the roof of the mouth, moving from that T position. This would, of course, create too much pressure and they would lose their mouth fill. Now, the answer could very simply be, okay, well, instead of rolling the tongue back, we simply lift the tongue into a K position, which would make a lot of sense. Except for that with most students, there are a lot of paired movements between the tongue and the larynx. And as they lift their tongue up into that K position, often their larynx goes up with it, creating too much pressure, and they swallow the mouth fill. This is what I've, I've been observing in, in students learning how to mouth fill, starting with constant pressure mouth fill. So what are all those incredible divers out there that are executing perfect constant pressure mouth fills doing? This is mostly speculation because I haven't tested this enough. I have, I've tested this with three 100 meter divers so far. Those three divers all use a constant pressure mouth fill for their dives, but there is one specific thing that they're doing when they transition from the cheeks to the tongue. And that is that they begin a slow, smooth lift of their larynx from a lowered position to the top position. So it seems to me that most of the pressure for their equalization is also created by a slow, smooth, lift of the larynx. I asked all those divers as well what they thought they were doing with their tongue, what they felt they were doing with their tongue during that part of the, the mouth fill, and they all described it as, as being more of a sliding, sliding their tongue back as opposed to rolling it back. So let's look at the mouth fill technique that I've been working with since the MRI scans. The success of this method is what really inspired me to put out this particular video because I've just been having such immense success with it. I've been blown away by how easily students have been able to learn and then execute it. So number one, the charge. A diver charges air into both their oral and nasal cavity at the same time. And as they do so, they lower their larynx and they hold it in a lowered position. Now there is a focus on keeping the larynx held down, not lifting it up, not using it to create any pressure or to cause the equalization at all. The divers equalize by simply pulsing or pushing with their cheeks. In between equalizations, they are relaxing and going loose. And all the while, while they're pushing with their cheeks, they are focused on keeping their larynx held down. When the air is compressed to the point where they can't create the pressure just with their cheeks, they move the air back and forward from their cheeks back to a P frenzel, to their cheeks, then eventually back to a T frenzel. Keep it in their cheeks, back to a K frenzel, in their cheeks, eventually back to a H frenzel. When they're frenzeling, they are using their larynx 
to lift up and create the pressure and not sliding or moving the tongue at all. I call it the single source mouthfeel because at any given time, you're only using one muscle group to create the pressure for the equalization. And because all of these things need cool names. So let me talk about why I believe the single source mouthfeel has been so effective. For starters, by keeping the larynx dropped for the first half of the mouthfeel, we have ensured that the soft palate will be kept open. Soft palates getting stuck and suddenly not being able to equalize is a very common issue for divers who are learning how to mouthfill or who are still perfecting their mouthfill technique. Though, since I started teaching this mouthfill method, I have not had a single student complain that their soft palate has, has gotten stuck during the mouthfill, or I've not had someone say, oh, I just was suddenly not able to equalize. Holding the larynx down keeps the soft palate open. Just as a reminder, let's have a look again at the video where the larynx drops down and what happens to the soft palate. Now, keeping the larynx pulled down also ensures that the tongue is pulled down. One of the most common issues that divers run into when they're learning or developing their mouth fill is that they put their tongue up against the roof of their mouth. They put their tongue into a frenzel position. And I mean, I think this is incredibly understandable because it's the position that they're accustomed to holding their tongue and their mouth in when they're free diving. So it's, it's very easy and natural for them to revert to that position. But when the tongue is against the roof of the mouth, when we are creating a seal with the tongue, we are then not able to equalize with the air that's in our cheeks. <laughs> if we can't get the air past the tongue, we can't get it into the nasal cavity. Now, besides these issues, I believe that one of the most common reasons that a diver will lose their mouth fill is because they are equalizing with too much pressure. The vocal fold is always the weakest point. And so if we equalize with too much pressure, we will often just push the air back down into our lungs. I've spent a disproportionate amount of time over the past few months watching people <laughs> while they execute dry mouth fills. Now, what I've actually noticed with every single person is when they're in the cheek phase of their mouth, or when they're pressing with their cheeks, they are also doing slight or very large lifts or pumps with their larynx. So it's naturally become my suspicion that when divers are learning mouthfeel for the first time, they'll also be inclined to lift up the larynx when they're trying to work with the cheeks. So pressing with the cheeks and the larynx at the same time. Now it's a very natural thing for a person to do because they will be so accustomed to simply frenzel equalizing. They'll be so accustomed to lifting up the larynx to equalize. I do think though that pressing from both of these areas at once it might just be simply too much pressure for a beginner mouth filler or an intermediate mouth filler to handle. And it will be very likely that they are either constantly leaking their mouth fill or losing it in large swallows or gulps. Experienced divers have obviously worked out the exact amount of pressure required to equalize, but then not lose it, or their vocal folds or glottises have become strengthened over the years. So zipping back to the single source mouth fill, by focusing on keeping the larynx pulled down and only pressing from the cheeks, not pressing from two sources at once, so far the divers who I've taught this mouthfill to, who have been doing this mouthfill, have not had the typical issues with leaking their mouthfill, swallowing their mouthfill, or the general feeling of discomfort associated with first learning how to mouthfill. I believe partly that is because they're not equalizing with too much pressure and then trying to hold or maintain that pressure just with the vocal fold the entire time. In general, from the preliminary findings, I think that the single source mouthfeel offers more control to a diver learning mouthfeel for the first time. It offers more control and it eliminates so many of the typical issues that a beginner mouth filler or an intermediate mouth filler keeps running into. We keep the larynx lowered. This keeps our soft palate open. It keeps our tongue down. We equalize with only one source, so we don't overpressurize. When I've been thinking about this, I just keep coming back to how natural it always is for a diver to revert to frenzel, to either just keep frenzeling while I hold air in their cheeks, <laughs> or to, to raise the larynx in conjunction with the cheeks and overpressurize the mouthfeel. In my experience teaching mouthfeels, these issues happen all the time. So let's look at the second half of the single source mouthfill 
the part where we're throwing the air back and forward from the cheeks into frenzel positions. To be honest, when I first taught this, I really wasn't certain it was gonna work. It seemed to me too complex or too difficult for those just beginning with the technique to be able to coordinate it. But I was proven wrong. Like I said in the beginning, the only reason why I'm making a video about preliminary findings, about findings which I feel like I haven't fully tested yet, is because of the initial overwhelming success. Here's my reasoning for throwing the air back and forward from the cheeks into frenzel positions. Remember how much air sits in the throat just on top of the vocal fold the entire time. I think that any air that sits in the throat like that on top of the vocal fold is constantly at risk of being leaked or just swallowed. So I think it's safer to move the air back into the cheeks. It takes some of the pressure off the vocal fold. Moving the air back and forward also ensures that they are gonna only be equalizing from one source, keeping the tongue stationary in a chosen frenzel position and then lifting up the larynx. When I have been teaching this, I have made a point to do two things. Number one, to make sure when they do that frenzel equalization, it is significantly gentler than a standard frenzel like thump, because <laughs> the frenzel equalization is usually quite strong. So they are equalizing gently, so they don't overpressurize and lose it down the vocal fold. And I get my students to work with a lot of drills, moving their tongue from a P, T, K, H position, running through the sequence. And that is the single source mouthfeel. I think it's quite simple and controlled, but more importantly, it's very easy to learn. We'll have to see in the long run if it is as effective a technique for deeper dives, but thus far, it is the easiest mouthfeel for a beginner freediver to execute that I have so far observed. I believe that when we are teaching equalization, we need to begin with developing larynx control. We need to be able to lift it, lower it, with the tongue in many different positions. We need to be able to move it in smooth, constant motions up and down. For Frenzel, develop control of the vocal fold, develop control of the soft palate, choose a seal that's comfortable, lift the larynx to equalize, lower the larynx to reverse pack. For mouthfeel, charge the mouthfeel into the oral and nasal cavity at the same time, keep the larynx lowered and push with the cheeks, and then at the end, throw the air back and forward from the cheeks into a frenzel position. It's all very simple when I say it like that. <laughs> I am actually now going to refilm all of my equalization videos on Patreon. I'm gonna systemize the process so it's all one easy transition from learning how to frenzel with great control of the larynx, moving to advanced frenzel, and then the single source mouthfeel with exercises to help build the skills as we move along the timeline or the process. That's pretty exciting for me. <laughs> I'd also really love to know your thoughts about this. Do you believe that my observations are correct? Do you have any thoughts on the initial findings of these experiments? I'd really love to see these techniques run with and developed by the freediving community. I mean, all of this knowledge is for us anyway. Thank you once again to all of my patrons on Patreon. They are the ones that make these videos possible. If you are keen to join, you can donate whatever you're comfortable with. $2, $5, $10 a month, whatever you are comfortable with. Thank you once again, and I will see you in the water somewhere. This video was made possible because of our patrons. Learn how you can support us and get access to the world's most complete freediving manual by clicking here. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and you might want to check out this video because I think you will like it.